It's my pleasure to welcome on stage Dr. Gernot Grümer, the founder and administrative director of the Austrian Space Forum, who will share his thoughts about the future Mars exploration. Gernot, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you. So good afternoon, everybody. And uh, I have a hard time now because right now after lunch, about 50% of your circulating blood flow is in your belly and lacking the brains. So if you fall tired, that's total, totally physiological. So that, that's OK. So my challenge will be to, to keep you awake, but more, more importantly, inspire you in a way to take you 380 million kilometers away from here. So if I might introduce myself a little bit further, thanks for the kind introduction beginning. My name is Gernot Grömer. I'm both here admin director of the Austrian Space Forum, but I'm also an active analog astronaut, so this is actually my, my working suits. Um, weighing about 50 kilograms, takes about three hours to put it on, put it on five months of basic training until you're allowed to use it. So why, why I'm, I'm doing this is, first of all, let me give you a, a quick, quick, quick three-minute introduction to Mars for those of you who are not that familiar. I know the ones who aren't on Mars exploration know everything I'm going to tell you in the next three minutes by heart, but nevertheless, I think it's good to have a common joint context to the same. So Mars, uh, from the environmental perspective, uh, can be a cold, barren desert, minus 70 degrees uh, Celsius average temperature, about 10, less than 10 millibars of average uh, uh, air pressure, and this is comprised out of 95% CO2. Uh, it's very, very dry. The amount of precipitable uh, water in the atmosphere is about 10 microns of water. So this is drier than the driest cake you've ever eaten in your life, I guess. So the distance between Earth and Mars can be up to 380 million kilometers. That means that a, a, a message from Earth to Mars may take more than 20 minutes. So if you have a problem on Mars and you say, Kjeltsche, we have a problem, it takes up to three quarters of an hour until you get the response, aha, uh -huh, and what exactly? So, so the, the small talk of Mars is something really, really challenging. However, it is now a cold, dry, barren desert, but we have strong evidences that it was not like this uh, for a long time. So we, we have found evidences, and these are almost smoking gun evidences, where we see uh, layers of old sedimentary structures 3.5 billion years ago when Mars still used to have lakes, when Mars still used to have, used to have rivers flying, flowing, and where you can actually, actually go deep sea diving on Mars because the ocean is about three kilometers uh, deep. So the amount of time Mars had liquid water on its surface is about 1 billion years. This is about five times the amount of time life on Earth took to evolve. So the $1 million question is if life ever arose on Mars, and if yes, if it's still there, or if it, there are remnants of it still there. And that's the reason why there actually is an invasion from Earth. Earth. Every two years we have this launch window when Mars and, uh, and Earth are just in the right constellation to, to send out uh, uh, probes. Not all of them make it there, so that's one of the reasons why when you send humans there, you want to make it as safe as possible. But the technology we're, we're sending there, the amount of knowledge that goes into engineering is just breathtaking. I mean, just the mere thought of shooting a one-ton spacecraft flight, the Curiosity rover you see on the screen behind me, over a distance of 380 million kilometers, injecting into the Martian atmosphere within uh, at Mach 32, breaking down the zero within eight minutes with no active control from Earth because of the time delay, and then firing 84 explosive mechanisms at the right millisecond to deploy the parachute at the right time, to get rid of the heat shield at the right time, to fire the sky grid at the right, right time. This is something where I have to admit, when we were watching, online with a little bit of a time delay, my fingernails were bitten very, very short. These are the famous eight minutes of terror. But once you are on the surface, it's a new world opening with stories we couldn't even imagine a generation ago. So what you see here is the development uh, worth about 20 years of development work, literally thousands of people behind this, the brightest minds on this planet from across the world. It's not only NASA flying there, there are instruments that are from Europe and from other 
other sites around the world, and they're doing marvelous work. One of the things, this is by the way, the belly of the beast, because we're here at the ERC, I think you'll appreciate the amount of technology that goes into the rovers, and like in a nice sports car, it looks great from the outside, but the real cool part is when you open the hood and you look at the engines inside, and that's what you see here, the, the cable uh, structures. Uh, one of the experiments we see happening right there as we speak now is the MOXIE experiment. I usually don't focus on single experiments, but this is one example I'm, I'm particularly fond of because it's an experiment which is of no use to astrobiology. It's of no use to uh, space exploration when you want to land rovers on Mars, but one day humans will land on Mars and they will work with machinery that is able to process Martian atmosphere the CO2 is split up with the carbon and the oxygen with the Sabatier process and produce CH4, the methane gas, afterwards using local water resources. And this machine here is able to produce the oxygen for the astronauts to breathe one day and the oxygen from, for engines uh, to, to, to be fueled by this oxygen returning to Earth one day again. So this is the, the, the uncle of the machine that will one day help to bring humans back from Mars. So this is happening as we speak. So by the standards of our grandfathers, we are living in a science fiction world. Who would have thought two generations ago that that little reddish dot in the sky is a world that helps us to understand our own and might be able to answer the question if we are the only ones in the universe. Um, I'm speaking about innovation, I'm talking about uh, electronics and the technical, uh, technological challenges, just uh, as an example here. I think the 31st flight of the Ingenuity helicopter on Mars is happening as we speak these days now. So by the way, who, who, who doesn't know about Ingenuity? Anybody who has never heard about the Ingenuity helicopter so far? Everybody knows in this room, I guess. I hope, otherwise you're in the wrong session. All right, so the reason I'm choosing this picture is because just to build such a thing takes an, amount of, an enormous amount of innovation. And I am making here a bold prediction. Now we are switching to the future a little bit. I would predict, and mark my words, in 80 years from now, there will be, because of the challenging environment on Mars, there will be lots of innovation happening. Innovation means patents, new technologies, things we as citizens can benefit from. I am predicting that in 80 years from now, there will be more patents filed from Mars than on any given country on Earth. In 80 years, we're going to meet again, and then you challenge me to this, this claim here. Okay? Okay. So, uh, I, I, I spoke about an invasion from Earth, and if you don't believe me, just look at the graph. This is all the missions that have been flown to Mars so far. Not all of them made it there. You see all the ones that, that end with an X here, they've failed. Especially, the, this chronologically, starting in 1960, uh, and we're getting better at this, obviously. But the bottom line is, if you were a robotic spacecraft in the 70s or 80s, your chance of actually reaching the surface would be roughly 50-50. And when you send humans there, you want to make sure the chance are a little bit better than 50-50, of course, especially for the return flight. And uh, so there, there's increasing number of countries, Soviet Union, uh, also Russia, United States, uh, Japan, e European Space Agency, India, and others are, are to come, including rovers, four active rovers on the surface. And the story doesn't stop here. We have uh, in the next launch, we in the 24, Japan and India going for orbiters. Uh, there might be a Starship demo flight. It was originally scheduled for 25. I don't believe that really 26 might be the better choice of a, of a, of a uh, launch window. In 28, that's where uh, a lot more hardware will land. Uh, the Chinese will land again on the Mars. Japan and maybe ExoMars within e the ESA project will see about 28 window. Well, there's a lot of challenges going ahead because of the cutting out of the uh, of the Russian uh, European partnerships here. Uh, the bottom line is we're also roughly doubling the amount of uh, space debris on the surface of Mars. Uh, we are now at, what, 19 tons or so. I think we're about 31 tons after that, th those missions as well. So to do so, uh, the, or, or, or the, the reason behind those robotic missions is, of course, in preparation for human missions. And this is exactly what we're working here in the Austrian Space Forum as well. I want to give you a glimpse a sneak preview, not about mission scenarios, not about mission architecture that might change and evolve in the next years or so. It's more about what if you would be in the space field of the very first pause person landing on Mars. I firmly believe that the very first person to walk on Mars is already born. It is just now entering elementary school or high school in Kielce in 
Beijing in New York, who knows? So the crew for that voyage exists already. They just don't know it yet. Okay. And so we're we're building spacesuit simulators in the Austrian space frame, put them through harsh conditions here at minus 110 degrees Celsius in a cryo uh, chamber test. We expose them to radiation, we expose them to electrical discharges that are emulating uh, the discharges of wind devils on Mars, you know, the, those dust devils which are picking up a lot of electrostatic uh, energy, and we expose the suit uh, to, ex to its capacity to uh, deflect um, the electricity at 6 megavolt with a Tesla coil, and who kn whoever works with Tesla coils, Tesla coils knows this is quite a dangerous experiment, and I'm very happy to report this worked out fairly well for the suit bearer, because that was me. Um, we go then and, and push the limits by exposing the suits, the infrastructure, the rovers we built to get with our partners uh, to harsh environments. Like here in the, uh, the, the Kepler station in Oman in our 2018 mission, this was a habitat that was specifically built just for our own mission, including inflatable components and uh, container-based solutions for a crew of 15, where we were really in the middle of nowhere, so lot, way, way, way away from any type of civilization, and this was our private Mars, so to say. Uh, and, the, and there's lots of technology there. There are a number of peer-reviewed experiments, ranging from robotics, astrobiology, human factors, you name it, uh, to study the challenges and pitfalls of having humans on the red planet. Because if there's one thing we're grateful for, is if we fail. we failing is where we learn. So we are, for, we are grateful for every mistake we make, because every mistake we make, we hopefully re don't repeat on Mars. That's, that's the idea. Fail fast, fail cheap, have a steep learning curve. That's the motto of the Austrian space form. Or another example, here in the Negev desert in, uh, in Israel, that was last year in October, uh, for the MRD-20 expedition. And if you're very, very nice to me and maybe buy me a beer or so afterwards, I have some mission patches to spare afterwards. Um, and uh, this was a, an example, actually, of what's the 13th mission we've been doing. We are preparing right now for our 24 uh, mission already in Egypt uh, in uh, two and a half years from now. Uh, so this was in October last year, 24 experiments, 250 researchers from more than 25 nations. It's highly international. So the official working language we have for the Austrian Space Forum is BE, broken English. So, of course, you need a large support team in the background. This is a typical uh, staffing of, of uh, the mission support and on an average um, uh, simulation day. So, the, you see a number of people who are specialized into flight support, uh, flight planners, uh, biomedical engineers. We have uh, psychologists. We have uh, uh, people working on the remote science support, the flight control teams, and so on. So, there's a, quite an infrastructure that is barely visible if you just look at the nice pictures. Uh, and this is actually one of those nice pictures. This is the site where we were in the Negev Desert uh, with a station we built together with our colleagues from DMARS and the Israeli Space Agency where our people would spend roughly uh, one month in isolation. This is actually uh, the station at nightfall, so this is quite a, a magic moment, as you can imagine, when the, uh, the sky is getting dark and the first stars are appearing, and you realize, oh my god, on Mars, we would have exactly that very sky above us, like we have on Earth, with only one exception. It's not that you're looking for Mars up in the sky because you're standing on it, you will be looking for the Earth, where you come from. Huh? Inside is busy as hell, as you can imagine. So the natural enemy, there are two natural enemies of the astronauts and the analog astronauts. One is the flight surgeons, because they can ground you, and the other one is the sand um, and the flight plan. So you want to make sure that you're at good friends with, with all, all of them. Um, you do a lot of, actually, there should be a video here, just in the background. You see a little bit of moving here. You see this really, the, the, the depth of the desert here. It's, it's one of those magical things where you realize, oh my gosh, I'm standing here on behalf of a much large team from across the world getting, and this is the coolest part, a sneak preview of the future. This is, no matter how the actual mission to Mars looks like, a little bit of this will be based upon this type of research, and that's our way how to get there. And we don't do this alone, we do this with rovers as well. That means we have here, for instance, uh, uh, flying drones or helicopters. This is one of our uh, actually four flight vehicles we had for the M20 expedition. It's a it's a model version of the Osprey. You might know this is this vertical takeoff and landing uh, airplane, which has tilt rotors. So you're taking off like helicopter. You tilt the rotors and you fly like an airplane, which is more energy efficient. Uh, and do the mapping. So you see here, for instance. 
the actual station. Uh, you know, actually, the, the original resolution is like two centimeter ground resolution of, dig of the digital elevation model, the solar panels here, and you have the terrain here. And this has been processed at the mission support center where you have the capacity of the computational power to process this data and then feed it back into a rover like this one. This is a Makata rover, a 600 kilogram beast uh, which is able to roam Mars in an autonomous way. Now you would say, well, there are autonomous cars on the roads already, but believe me, the more degrees of freedom you have, the more challenging it gets for the rover to decide where to go, especially when you have uh, very unsolid ground below your feet. Or you do it totally passive, you don't care about wheels, you don't care about uh, propulsion, you let do Mars, uh, you let Mars do it for you. Uh, this is a two meter hike called Tumbleweed, a student experiment, which is passively driven through the desert with a, a sensor package, and wherever the wind goes, you go as well. So this is quite an uh, astonishing experiment just done by originally high school students now they are actually uh, making company out of it while they are studying. So this is an example of, of, of projects that catch the attention by inspiration but turn out to be the solid businesses and solid science at the end of the day. You have a lot of public attention to this, obviously. For instance, this is a life link between the United Nations um, uh, UN COPOS meeting, the Committee for the uh, Peaceful Use of Outer Space, uh, where we report actually from the field and of course lots of media activities uh, involved with this as well. But it's gaining traction. Like uh, analog research, this entire field was quite an exotic field a couple of years ago. But there are so many groups emerging that, that many of them are getting to a professional point where they're catching the attention of the agencies. And the more professional we are, the more likely is it is that the knowledge we are generating and the scientific best practice uh, standards is feeding into those actual mission architectures. So it's a world for ours to, 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 for the taking, for, for the scientific taking, so to say. So I don't know if you know the movie The Martian. For those of you who don't know it, it's an American astronaut stranding on the surface of Mars and surviving on potatoes for the next year before the rescue mission comes. And the tagline for this movie is bring him home. I say, no, 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 don't, don't bring him home. I say, take us there. And, and note there is even a very bold statement here with the flight date already. So. Maybe if you throw gray hair there anymore. So we do it for the zeros and the ones of instruments. The science is the primary reason why we should go over there. I see as a scientist, but I'm also talking as a human. And as much as we can do with the rovers, uh, we know for sure when you look at the data, that humans can be much more productive and efficient than rovers, also because of real-time decision-making with a very different of CPU type where we're operating on, but also about the narrative. I think only way I've been with your feet, you've really been there. Yeah? So um, one day there was going to be exactly this picture in the mind of, of somebody standing there, that you see the Earth from, from Mars. I think most of you know this picture of a Martian sunset. And uh, I just imagine this, the, the mindset you will have at this very moment, and you realize, oh my gosh, how many rivers did we have to cross? How many mountains to climb? How many wars to fight? How many operas to write in here until a human can tell us firsthand account what it'll be there to enter a new world? And again, the very first human to walk on Mars is already born. Actually, this, this picture is a quite iconic picture in our organization. It's actually uh, the, the girl and the man in the spacesuit is father and daughter in real life as well. Uh, so we, as we sit in here, we might be too old to do the actual mission, but we will be the ones at the basement of the, the base of the pyramid upon which we are becoming a multiplanetary species. So I would like to conclude with paraphrasing a, a, a famous quote somebody else said originally, don't tell me the sky is the limit when there are footprints on the moon and within our lifetime on Mars. Thank you. <laughs>